Okay, let's go ahead and get started on some more trig limits. Uh, in the last video, we talked about sort of the conceptual backdrop and the three things you really had to remember when approaching trig limits. Uh, I won't belabor that point since we, since I, you know, ran through them a couple times in the last video, and you can just, you know, consult that video again. Uh, but I do want to go through uh, several examples uh, so that we can sort of get a grasp as to how this ha how how this all works. Okay. Uh, now, I hope you have the trig limits in front of you, uh, the trig limit identities, that is, uh, but just in case you need to write them down again as we're going through this, uh, those are the two uh, identities that we need, okay? The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1, and the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x is equal to 0, okay? Now, Let's say we have something like the limit as t goes to 0 of sine squared t over t. Well, obviously that's not exactly the same as this, okay? With the exception of the whole change of variable, which is, you know, not really that big of a deal. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed forward. Now, in order for this, in order for this to look like this, I need to take that sine that sine squared and split it up. Now remember sine squared t is the lazy man's way of doing sine t the whole quantity squared. Okay, So whereas sine t squared the t, just the t is squared, this is synonymous with sine squared t because the whole function is squared sine t squared is not equal to sine squared t. This is the way we show that the whole function is squared. This is the way that we show that just the angle measurement expression is squared, okay? So if we want to take this and we want to change the form and we do the limit as t approaches 0 of sine t over t, and like I said in the last video, we can go ahead and pull that apart into its constituent factors, okay? Now I have it. And of course, if I wanted to belabor the point of limit laws, I could go ahead and write this as two separate limits that are multiplied together because the limit of a product is equal to the product of those limits. I don't have to do that, but as long as you know that this is this, you can kind of skip that step and sort of do it in your head. I mean, it's sort of a not really a full step, it's kind of a half step anyway. Now this right here is of course by identity equal to one. This right here is equal to zero when I plug in because you're capable of evaluating that one just by plugging in and therefore that limit is zero, okay? So not too hard in terms of, in terms of a, an example to run through. Okay, let's, let's do one that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, let's do the limit as theta approaches 0 of secant theta minus 1 over theta. Okay, well why is that so difficult? Well, because our identities have to do with sine and cosine and not with secant. But if you remember how we used to change the form uh, back when we were doing trig IDs, anytime you saw a difference like this when you had a reciprocal trig function, your first instinct should be, well, let's go ahead and see what happens when I multiply by its reciprocal. And if I multiply by its reciprocal, when I distribute the cosine to the secant, the reciprocals, they make one. When I distribute it to the negative one, I get minus cosine theta over theta. Now I don't want to forget this cosine theta, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm not going to combine the denominator here with this expression because I recognize the fact that that factor right there, with the exception of the fact that it's in terms of theta instead of x, is one of my identities, right? Okay, now I know that the limit as theta approaches zero of this bad boy is zero. And I know as theta approaches zero, that's one over one, or one. But of course, the one right here is overpowered by the factor which gives us a zero. So the limit of that particular expression is also zero, okay? Now I'm gonna to try to get through a couple of these before we sort of start you know, getting up in time and whatnot. 
Um, let's go ahead and do, uh, and this one's rather straightforward. I'm not going to get to the nasty ones here in, until just a second. Okay, now we've already seen one where we had a sign in the denominator, right? And when we pulled it apart, we could actually supply the variable in the numerator, and it didn't matter the fact that it was sine ax over ax, or, or ax over sine ax, because it was simply the reciprocal of the identity, and the reciprocal of 1 is simply 1, okay? But I want to do the same thing here that I did with that kind of nasty one with tangent and sine in the last video. I, I know that 1 minus cosine is part of one of my limit identities, and I know that sine theta is a part of a different one. So that should be the key, that should be the indication that I need to pull these apart into separate factors. Okay, And in doing that, I open up this denominator where I can supply a theta. Now, of course, I can't just put thetas in there willy-nilly, because uh, otherwise I've changed the value. But I know I can do that because I'm going to be supplying a theta in this numerator over here as well. And so I've multiplied by theta over theta. And notice that theta is not equal to 0. Theta is approaching 0, so this is a perfectly legitimate move. And I see the fact that this factor is my second identity, and it goes to 0. This factor is my first identity. It goes to 1. And oh my gosh, for the third time in a row, we have a limit that's equal to 1. That's equal to 0, OK? All right, let's go ahead and move on to uh, ones that are probably a little bit more fun. Uh, <laughs> of course, you guys remember my definition of fun. Oh, I remember Ro used to groan every time I said that. Okay. Now, how do I change the form of this one? Well, the answer is I don't want to change the form of this one. Why don't I want to change the form of this one? Those of you who have been paying attention, you see that right there. We don't have x approaches 0. We have x approaches pi over 6. So actually, when we plug in, we get pi over 6 over sine pi over 2, because the pi over 6 gets multiplied by 3 before it gets signed, really. And sine of pi over 2 is 1, and that's just straight up pi over 6, OK? Yeah, so the writer of, I'm actually looking at a calculus textbook right now, the writer of that calculus textbook was uh, equally as tricky as me, so naturally I love him. Um, and, and we go over problems like that every once in a while, and they'll likely be sprinkled throughout the homework in the, in the Stewart book as well, simply to underscore the fact that we need to remember that it's not the expression itself that creates the identity. It's the fact that it's that expression as x approaches a particular value. And the two identities that we have been given are the particular value of x approaching 0. So if it does not approach 0, we do not use the identity. We actually go ahead and try and plug it in. Uh, or if that doesn't work, try to change the form in another way besides trying to morph it. Uh, into the identities, or there's actually uh, exceptions to that rule, but we'll get to those here in just a second, okay? Now, uh, let's go ahead and let's look at the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 2x sine 3x over x squared, okay? Sorry, that's a horrible 2. Let's try and remedy that. That's a little bit better. Okay, so what we're going to do here, well, we see the fact that I have a sine 2x and a sine 3x. I have two factors in the numerator that are sine functions. And I have two factors in the denominator that are x's. So notice the fact that I can't apply the identity until such time as it actually looks like sine of ax over ax, right? I need it, and it doesn't matter what the coefficient is, like I said before, as long as it matches in the numerator and denominator, that is equal to 1 according to my identity. Okay. Now what I need to do here is I need to go ahead and pull that apart into sine 2x over x and sine 3x over x. 
And once I've done that, it ought to be fairly clear what I'm going to do. Okay? I'm going to take and I'm going to provide the 2 here, and I'm going to provide the 3 here. But if that's all I do, I have changed the value of this limit. Because I functionally divided by 6, the only way to divide by 6 and not have it change the value is to also multiply by 6. And I know that this factor right here is 1, and this factor right here is 1, so it's 6 times 1 times 1. That limit is 6. Okay. Now that is a couple of examples, uh, and let's go ahead and do one more before we get to ones that are particularly nasty. Uh, and of course I show you the nasty ones simply because if you understand the nasty ones, even if you can't do them by yourself, uh, you should be able to, if you can follow the logic, that means uh, that you understand the material uh, at a higher level. Okay. And actually, since we're sort of getting on in minutes, I may make the, the really nasty ones into a separate video, and you can uh, sort of watch it at your leisure if you want to. It won't be, won't be absolutely necessary to do that. But here, we obviously have tangent of 4x and secant, I mean, tangent of 4t and secant of t. Uh, let's go ahead and change the form. Now, I know that in order to get it into the form that I need it in, I'm going to need to change it in terms of sine and cosine, okay? Now, that means that I have a limit as t approaches 0 uh, of sine 4t over cosine of 4t times cosine of t over t, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, because all I did was take the secant t, and you can shove the secant t up in the numerator and change it into cosine, because it's just a simple reciprocal, right? Now, of course, anytime you have, you know, uh, a, b over c, you can go ahead and pull a out, or you can pull b out as well. That, you know, being in the numerator is the same as being multiplied. So what I did is I just brought the tangent down and transformed it into its quotient, right? Its implied quotient of sine over cosine. Now, what I want to do is I want to change the order of this just a little bit, and I can do that because multiplication is commutative, meaning that I can do it in any order. The whole reason why you learn the commutative property and the fact that I beat it into your heads ruthlessly. Now, from here, I recognize the fact that this factor is not going to be a problem at all. Because once I plug in 0 into both of these, they're both going to be cosine of 0, and it's going to be 1 over 1. What I need to do is I need to change the form of this one right here by providing the 4 in the denominator, but of course, lest I change the value, I need to multiply by 4 as well. And therefore, I get 4 times 1 times 1. That limit is 4. Okay. Now, having run through a couple of these examples, I hope that's helpful. Uh, I'll go ahead and do a couple of uh, rather nasty ones, like I said, in the next video, and, uh, and then we'll have, you know, That'll sort of be the uh, finale to uh, trig limits and fun with that math. So hope that helps, guys.